Hello and welcome to Eye on Africa. I'm Clarisse Fortuné. First, the headlines. President George Weah and opposition leader Joseph Wakai neck and neck in Liberia's presidential election. A second round sounds inevitable. Parts of Ghana underwater after heavy flooding caused by overfl the overflow of two dams in the Volta region. More than 8,000 are now displaced. And it's fashion season on the continent. Kibera Fashion Week just ended. An opportunity for local fashionista to go out in force in their favorite pieces in the country's biggest slum. Liberia's presidential election seems to be on track for a runoff after last week's ballot. Provisional results show President George Weah and opposition leader Joseph Wakai neck and neck below the threshold needed to avoid a second round. Justice Beidou explains. Liberians have been waiting with bated breath for results from last Tuesday's election, which has been very slow in coming in, according to some of the people. 78-year-old former vice president of the country, Joseph Buakai, is taking a second shot at the presidency against George Weah, who is the incumbent president, who is also seeking a second six-year mandate. These two were the people who were way ahead of 18 others who also uh, took part in this year's election. Figures from the country's electoral commission show that none of the leading two was able to secure the mandatory 50% that is required for anyone to get a one-touch uh, win. The runoff election is expected to happen two weeks after the Electoral Commission has made an official announcement of the result that it currently has. The election has been hailed as peaceful and well organized by the West African political bloc ECOWAS, along with other independent observers that came in to monitor the election. This election is the first since UN peacekeeping forces left Liberia in 2018. And now the latest from Gaza. An Israeli airstrike hit a hospital in Gaza City, resulting in the death of hundreds of people. Some are saying as many as 500 people killed at the Al Ali hospital, packed with wounded people as well as Palestinians seeking shelter. Meanwhile, Algeria is calling on the international community to take, I quote, urgent action. Algeria reiterates its full solidarity with its Palestinian brothers and calls on the international community to take urgent action to come to the aid of the oppressed and persecuted, to put an end to this aggression, and to relaunch the peace process. And South Africa's Foreign Minister Naledi Pendor confirmed she had a call with Hamas chief Ismail Hanye on behalf of the South African government. We discussed getting humanitarian aid to Palestine. South Africa is one of the few countries to publicly confirm it has had talks with Hamas since the war began last weekend, but has denied a report of offering support to the militant group in its conflict against Israel. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa said on social media, the Palestinian struggle against occupation does not equate to support for Hamas. End of quote. Now to Tunisia, where thousands took to the capital streets in support of opposition politician Abir Moussi. She was detained on October 3rd on suspicion of attempting to overthrow the government. Moussi, leader of the Free Destourian Party, has, had filed an appeal against a presidential decree. Lilia Blaise and Fadil Ali Jira report. <laughs> Supporters of opposition politician Abir Moussi and her Free Destruyan Party are calling for her liberation. She has been detained for almost two weeks now. She thinks that what is happening to her is the price of political struggle, and she trusts the courts to restore the truth. The investigation is ongoing, but her lawyers say there's no evidence. None of the accusations are well founded. There are no concrete details or data in this case. Until her arrest, Moussi was one of the last major opposition voices critical of the president who wasn't in jail. 
She now joins more than 20 other opposition figures behind bars, most of whom are accused of conspiring against state security. Some launched a hunger strike at the beginning of October to protest their extended pre-trial detention. Their families gathered to support them at this opposition party headquarters. We have no other choice but to use extreme tactics, like a hunger strike or sit-ins, for the simple reason that we have political detainees, political leaders detained when no crime has been committed. Judicial authorities are not communicating about these cases and have banned media from discussing them, something many organizations have criticized. No trial date has yet been set. Unfortunately, the judiciary doesn't give us even the broad outline of the case, so that Tunisian citizens who follow public affairs can see if there really is a conspiracy against the state or have a debate on the evidence. Unfortunately, we don't have those details. The political climate remains tense ahead of the next presidential election scheduled for 2024. South Sudan's President Salva Kiir is to host a meeting next week with Sudanese political leaders. Mr Kiir is appealing to end, I quote, the ongoing conflict through peaceful dialogue. It is not clear who will attend this meeting aimed at ending a brutal six-month conflict in a region. It's rainy season in Ghana and parts of southeastern of the country are underwater. Floodings had been triggered by water released by, from two dams into the Volta River. More than 8,000 people have already been displaced. Here's our West Co Africa correspondent, Justice Beidou again. Spillage from the Akosombo Dam is something that is not unusual. But many of the people who live along the course of the Volta River, which is the river on top of which this dam is located, say this year's spillage is one of the worst that they have seen in decades. This follows the spillage from two of the dams that supply a third of Ghana's electricity. The Volta River Authority, which is the body that manages these two dams, say they are going to continue with the spillage because if they don't, the water levels may affect the integrity of these dams. Ghana's president, Nana Akufuado, has visited the victims of the flood and has commiserated with them and has assured that the government would continue to support them. But critics say his government has been slow in reacting. They've given us rice and oil, but what we don't have is the charcoal and the coal pot to even cook with it. I am disabled and I need support, and the flooding has worsened my life as I've become too much of a burden to my caretaker. It's been a week and I've not been able to work. Even if I wanted to go to work, I don't have the money to cross the flood to go to the other side. The Ghana Meteorological Agency says it expects more rains, especially in southern Ghana, in the coming days. More than 26, 26 people were killed during violent protests on August 10, 2022. 20 of them were protesting over the soaring cost of living, and today is the first anniversary of their burials. But beside an investigation set up by the government, families' questions are still unanswered, according to a new report released by Amnesty International. Michel Eken is the author of this report. Michel, welcome to our studio. So first, I want to ask you, there was a special investigation committee set up by the government. What their feelings, what did they say? Well, the special committee um, said that, that the protesting amounted to um, trying to an, do an insurrection um, and turn down the government. They also um, recommended training of police officers um, into not using violence. What they fell short of is recommending uh, investigation into allegation of excessive use of force by police officers. We know that the protests turned violent, six police officers died, but we have at least 27 protesters and bystanders uh, who died, a lot of them from gunshots. So there needs to be an investigation into that. And the special committee um, fell short of asking that. They, even, they didn't even 
um, ask the families what happened. We talked to families. They said they weren't contacted by the special committee. Uh, they didn't know what's happening. So one year on, they still don't know uh, what happened to the loved one or whether justice was brought. So what do you think they should, the government should have done more? I think they should definitely do um, a full and an impartial investigation into all allegations um, of excessive use of force and all deaths, including police officers. We know that more than 500 people were arrested um, for riotous conduct, including murder, but there hasn't been into any investigation into, allegation, uh, into the allegation of excessive use of force. Michelle Aiken from Amnesty International. Thank you very much. Now, another completely different topic. It's Fashion Week season in Africa. Lagos Fashion Week is gearing up to show off its latest creations next week in Nigeria. And in Kenya, Kibera Fashion Week came to a close last Sunday. The event highlights the designs of those born and bred in the country's biggest slum, a chance to change the narrative and celebrate creativity. Among the rusted tin rooftops of Kibera, models strode down the catwalk in local designs. The purpose of Kibera Fashion is to be able to create opportunities for the young kids that are growing up right now because we grew up in an environment where we never used to have things like that. Most of our parents used to see like, you know, uh, doing fashion and design was not like an art and they just used to treat people like as tailors if you are like involved in fashion and design. Just 11 designers out of almost 400 made the cut for this show each with a different approach and different materials, from the usual suspects such as wool and cotton, to more unique pieces featuring pearls, metal and recycled materials. Rich in symbolism, some styles were post-apocalyptic and dystopian, while other designs featured large empty pockets, a jab at Kenya's overly educated, chronically underemployed youth. But if the designs were pessimistic, the audience was not. African fashion is special and it's coming up, so I think we need to promote it with such events so that people know that we can be creative and you can come out with new ideas and it's not just about Paris or Milan. Kenya, also in Africa in general, has talented designers and we can have forums like this to showcase such designs to the world. The outfits off the catwalk were just as eye-catching, with local fashionistas out in force in their favourite pieces. Well, that's it for this edition of Eye on Africa. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more news on France 24.